um, Kaberi is working clinically. I think she'll be logging in uh, from a ward somewhere, but uh, I'll introduce our speaker. It's uh, Professor Yen Jali, uh, who uh, is the research director uh, for the Center of Genomics and Policy. Uh, he works at the intersection of scientific knowledge, health law, and bioethics. So pretty fascinating area, I'm sure. Um, he was named Advocatus Emeritus by the Quebec Bar in 2012, and he's a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Um, he's both a member of the McGill Faculty of Medicine and the Health Sciences AI Health Launch Committee and the Faculty of Medicine Cyber Infrastructure Committee. So I think he actually um, has a lot of interesting areas of expertise, which we could, many of us could probably benefit from. Um, I know I like to uh, think I <laughs> could do genetics or AI type work, but um, I haven't even thought of some of these aspects. So take it away, Professor Jolie. Uh, I think you're muted still. Okay, sorry about this. I was just trying to unmute. So uh, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to talk a little bit about our research center uh, called uh, the Center of Genomics and Policy and about what it can provide in terms of services uh, in the field of uh, ethics uh, and uh, policies for uh, people uh, that have researchers that have projects in AI and are looking uh, for some assistance. Uh, so this is just the location of our center. We're really uh, on uh, the fifth floor of the Genome uh, Innovation Building. It's the new building on Dr. Penfield. And where you see the rectangular window in the middle is the floor we're actually located on. So uh, let me go to the next slide. So uh, what, we are is really a team that wants to apply multidisciplinary perspective uh, and to collaborate at both the national with national and international partners to analyze the social ethical and policy norms uh, influencing uh, the promotion prevention and protection uh, of humans uh, of human health and uh, we're located at the McGill uh, Genome Center, as I mentioned. We're uh, a center that's been created originally uh, in 1999 at the University of Montreal, moved to McGill uh, in 2009. And uh, our team is composed of three PIs. Uh, really, the international summit among us is, is part of NOPERS that has really, uh, I would say, created the field of uh, biotechnology ethics. Uh, and, and is the Canada uh, researcher uh, in uh, law and medicine. Uh, myself, who's the research director of the center, and my colleague, uh, Manzawadi. Uh, and, and we're a fairly large group, I would say the largest uh, center of our kind uh, in Canada, certainly, uh, and internationally, one of the biggest one probably as well, with over uh, 40 students and professional staff. Uh, with uh, multidisciplinarity is really key in, in our group. So we have people coming uh, from fields such as law, sociology, uh, bioethics, uh, core scientific disciplines such as genetics or medicine, uh, genetic, genetic counseling, uh, information technology, et cetera. Uh, and our research interests are really the ethical, legal, and social challenges of genomic health innovation and AI. So basically, we're really interested uh, in the latest development in the medical field and in both the research and the implementation of these latest development uh, into uh, medical care. And, and we have both a more uh, research aspect to our center where we basically apply like any big labs to research grant uh, and uh, in our fields. And sometimes we, we do it quite often as part of research grant of a scientific scholar that apply for a large grant and want to have an ethical or legal component. 
Uh, and we have a program called P3G2, which is really more applied and which is about developing uh, tools uh, in uh, ethics and policy to help out scientific uh, projects. And that's really what I'm gonna focus on today much more uh, th than uh, the research part. Uh, so. So we work generally, uh, when we do this on a fee-for-service or a plan, we really pr prefer to, to talk about a plan because it's very rare that people will need just one thing from us. And, and also it's much less expensive when we can say, okay, we're gonna do all the ethical you know, tools that you need for your project, uh, then if basically you, talk to us and say, well, I'd like you to make the consent form for my, proj for, for my project, but I don't need anything else. I mean, it may sound easy and, and you know, a consent form is fairly short, but then again, when you think about it, the consent form is at the art of the ethics process of your, of your AI project. So we need to know a lot of things and to spend a lot of time doing a consent form. So it might actually be quite expensive for that just one thing, and you might want to think about a package. Of course, we're not doing that. And I'll talk more to this at the end of my presentation. We're not a commercial organization. Uh, we are a university. In fact, uh, P3G2 used to be private, but even when it was a private project, uh, it was uh, not a commercial project. It was a non-profit generating entity. And, and so it's the same thing now. We work on the cost recovery model. So what can you get from us in terms of help if you have an AI project, whether it's in the field of genomics or even if it doesn't, we can help. Uh, so consultation on the ethical, legal and social aspect of your project. As you get started, uh, you know, probably questions are gonna be asked. Maybe you're gonna ask yourself some questions, maybe others such as the research ethics committee. Uh, or the funders themselves will ask you questions about the ethical, legal, and social aspect of your project. For example, how will you be protecting your data? What kind of data are you going to include in your project? Is there sufficient diversity in your data? Uh, who's going to access the data that is uh, stored uh, in your project, etc.? These are all kinds of questions that have not just scientific, but also ethical or legal or social aspect to them and that we can help you with. And this can happen at different stage of the project as well. Uh, Sometimes, you know, things are perfect until you hit a roadblock. And, and then, you know, you're in the middle of your uh, lifespan of your project, but you have that roadblock. You wanna, for example, share your data with another uh, uh, informatic database from another hospital in Ontario. Can you do it and how? Okay, that's something we can help with. Assistance with RAB approval process. So anything that has to do with being approved by the ethics committee, the follow-up, the putting the document together, uh, we can do it. Development of tools, guidelines, covering the different AI aspect of your project. You need a privacy policy, uh, for your project, we can uh, develop one. You need a pro you need a policy for collaboration with industry. Uh, we can also help you with that. Uh, organization and sport of data access committee. So nowadays, data committee have become quite important. Uh, if you are going to store personal data, which most medical data that is. Uh, that contains identifier, meaning that is somehow linked to the identity of a person. Uh, if your data is like that, uh, to start sharing that data, uh, especially if you're gonna share it outside the hospital, you definitely will need to think about this, these kinds of structure. Uh, and also, as I mentioned, we can do research, uh, sorry, on ethical and uh, policy issues some funders will actually require that you have a social, ethical, or policy component to your project in order to fund it. So that is as well something that we can do. Now, let's go more specifically into the tools and how it works out. So there's really three different stages that I, I would 
think about when, when you think about tool development. Uh, before the data collection, ongoing once that the database is operational, and I'm always assuming you're doing a, an AI project with data uh, from hospital patient. That's mostly what we, we see these days. If your project is different, uh, we would need to talk about it to see exactly if and how we can help. Uh, and additional options uh, are things that you might not need or you may need. So, so uh, they're really optional. Uh, so let's look at all of these different stages and what we can do there. So before the data collection, so uh, we talked about the consent. I told you that the informed consent process was at the art of your project. Why? Because it's where the conditions are set to about what you can actually do with your data or can't do. And, and also because it's required to be short and in lay language, this is a document that everybody can and need to understand. So you really need to put out uh, the most important information in a clear, concise manner. And there's different types of consent now. I mean, science has evolved and research has evolved. We're now talking about broad consent, dynamic consent. There's also cases where you can actually obtain what we call a consent waiver. So you might not even need a consent. Uh, to get the data from your patient uh, in some situation. So, so these are all things we can help looking into and developing. Uh, then uh, as soon as you have a database, uh, unless it's, it's purely clinical and you're not doing any research, you will need, and even then you would need a governance framework and, and, the pro and the, if you're doing research or research protocol as well, these are things we can help you develop Although we don't, of course, develop the scientific part of your protocol, that's up to you, but we can help with all the governance uh, and ethics aspect uh, of those frameworks. Privacy and security policy, standard operating procedure, confidentiality agreements, these are all things we can do. Uh, data sharing policies, uh, including timelines, data use agreement, material transfer agreement, Again, uh, these are all sorts of documents you may need as you're gonna start sharing uh, data and possibly samples uh, with other colleagues, institutions. Uh, engagement with industry. So the question comes up quite often, what happened if I have an industry partner? Can I do it? Can't I do it? What are the rules? What should I be careful about? So I, I do wanna be clear that we do not provide legal advice. Even though many of us are lawyers, the reason we don't provide legal advice is that uh, we would have to charge quite uh, more money if we did because our uh, responsibility as lawyers would then uh, be uh, involved uh, and also because we would have to do it for a profit. Uh, so this is something that we do not do, uh, but at the same time, there are many things that we can develop without them being formal uh, legal advice or legal document. Uh, incidental findings, uh, a big question nowadays uh, in genetics and in other fields uh, using big data is what if I find something that I didn't think I would find at the beginning of the project? What do I do with that? So that's the question of incidental finding. Do I return it to the person or because it's not something that I thought I would obtain as a result, and maybe it's not sufficiently robust or validated as a result, I should not tell them about it. So we develop these sorts of policies. Coordinate research ethics of probation. I talked about that before. A big, big, big uh, issue uh, that is emerging uh, and that is becoming very important, uh, and you'll have, all have to address it in your new project uh, as soon as you start to have project of large scale is how will you treat questions of inclusion, equity, and diversity uh, in your project? And, and that can uh, be asked at two levels. First of all, at the level of your team, if you have a large team in your project, uh, but also at the level, of course, of the data that you will be using for your project. How can you be sure that it's sufficiently diverse so you do not have bias, et cetera? And how is the governance of your project going to help you uh, in these two areas? And so we can help you develop a policy on that topic as well. 
Once the database is operational, you might want to think about data sharing, and that's where you think about a, a, a data access office. Uh, we can help coordinate those data access office, uh, act as a secretariat, basically, and help develop the policies. Uh, we can help you also uh, look at policies from other databases you want to collaborate with to see if your policies and their policies are uh, sufficiently similar that you can actually exchange data with them if, if everything is fine with the two database exchanging. Uh, we can also look, let's say you want to include more data and you already have a database, uh, you can contact us at that point in time and we'll do what we call a retrospective review to look at whether your policies that you developed maybe five years ago are sufficiently broad and permissive to allow you to uh, add those data sets that you now want to add to your database authorship and acknowledgement policy. So what happens if somebody uses data from your database? How can they acknowledge you? Uh, we can help develop policies on this. Ongoing assistance with ethical issues, which is, I think, self-explanatory. Privacy breach notification. I mean, you think these things don't happen, although we know that they do. And I can tell you for having worked with many projects, they do. What do you do? when uh, there is a privacy breach. And most of the time, these are fairly minor ones, but how do you deal with them? We can help you, uh, you know, decide a strategy and even, you know, when it happens, uh, help you uh, to, to realize, to put that plan into action. And finally, something a lot of people uh, don't think about is closure. So when is your project gonna end? You probably think, well, you know, I'll keep that database as long as I can, or maybe when my funding ends, but okay, what then? And, and what if the project has to end earlier than, than you would have thought for all kinds of reason? Uh, maybe your co-investigator and you are not getting along and don't wanna to work together. Maybe uh, you were hoping to uh, obtain some additional funding that you didn't get. So what do we do at that point in time? And what if the project uh, is a private project and becomes bankrupt. You know, these sorts of things are what we mean by closure and by having a closure plan, which is quite important. Uh, optional uh, things we can look at for you is, uh, can you store your data in the cloud and, and what policy do you need there? Uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, we can act as a research component of your project on ethical, legal, social question. So questions that we can look into for you is, are there potential bias in the type of data you're including and how can that be helped? How can that be resolved? Uh, is, can you, uh, you know, use, uh, for example, a big question now is that of risk prediction model and where do they, fall into in terms of regulation? Are they diagnostic tool? Are they decision aid? What's the difference between the two? Uh, and what does it mean for the researcher? These are the kind of questions we like to investigate. Uh, and finally, compliance and integration of novel policies to your existing framework. Well, let's say you need to meet a new ISO standard. We can help confirming whether you're meeting it or what needs to be changed or you decide that you wanna follow the policies of the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, we'll be happy to tell you which of those you need to go for and, and which would be more complicated for you to implement. So these are this is just a really broad overview of the kind of things that we do. But to make it more tangible, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes really quickly to speak about two or three projects that we work on to, to show you a little bit how that collaboration really take shape. Uh, so, uh, and I took some project that you probably know some of you uh, to, to really make it more uh, tangible for you. So the first one is uh, for Secure Cloud. Uh, Secure Cloud is a cloud platform that's been developed uh, by Guillaume Bourque uh, with uh, also Vincent Ferretti at the University of Montreal. Uh, and the idea is a cloud platform in Quebec, made in Quebec to host and analyze voluminous health and clinical data securely in full compliance with regulatory and industry standard. Uh, and it is now open for business if you need to store your data. 
uh, and it's a collaboration with Calcul Quebec where a lot of the infrastructure is located. And so what did we do for, for uh, Guillaume's project? Well, as you can see from uh, this, the little uh, schema on the right, uh, privacy is a really complicated thing when you talk about the cloud. These are just uh, some of the various category of privacy, security, uh, legislation, uh, and good practices that the cloud had to conform with in order to really meet all the requirements uh, to be uh, in, in the top class in Quebec. So we had to, uh, of course, we collaborated with some uh, information technology specialists on this as well. We didn't do it by ourselves, but we basically reviewed all of these standards and obligations to see which ones specifically applied to secure cloud. So that's an example of something that we did. Uh, of course, uh, consultation on privacy, compliance, liability, who's responsible of the data in this cloud. Uh, assistance uh, in identification and compliance with the policy requirement, as I mentioned. Uh, eventually, we might uh, also help them with the data sharing policy. Uh, it's a little bit early at this point, but it's probably something we'll look into. A big question when you have database these days is, are you compliant with the European uh, GDPR? Uh, because if you're not, you won't be able to ch exchange data with European partners. And uh, also we're helping them with question of inclusion uh, and equity and diversity. Another project that uh, is in development and that we're helping is uh, the Quebec Smart Care Consortium. Uh, that is a, a public-private consortium uh, led, I'm sure most of you know Opal, so led by Opal Health uh, Informatic Group, that application that, that John Kildea and his group developed. The objective is to use patient-centered data and mHealth technologies for remote care and artificial intelligence research. So uh, the application is submitted. Uh, we're a second round at the FACS competition right now. And, and this is what we're uh, doing for the project. The Envision contribution of our center is a consultation on data governance, ethics and conformity aspect of the project. Uh, we help them develop the consent for research procedure and are gonna continue developing that with them. Uh, development of an ethical framework to collaborate with industry. There are several industry partners. You see some of them uh, mentioned on, on this slide here. So uh, that was an important piece uh, that we had to uh, help them develop and develop data sharing policy uh, and assistance planning the data sharing policy because of course there is a plan to share data quite broadly uh, again within the consortium and even to outside parties. Uh, so we have to develop a policy to do that in a safe manner. Another project we're involved with, uh, which is a perfect example of a risk prediction uh, model AI project, uh, it's an implementation pan-Canadian oncology project led by Jacques Sima at Laval University. And uh, the idea is to assess the acceptability and feasibility and outcome of risk-based screening using new comprehensive risk prediction web-based tool, which is called Bodicea. Uh, which has been developed in the UK originally uh, within existing mammography centers in Quebec and Ontario. So basically we want to implement this risk-based prediction model uh, on, a, on a wide scale in both Quebec and Ontario uh, health establishment. And uh, we want to assess what are some of the challenges uh, of doing this. Uh, and, and there's a lot of questions of course that are raised uh, and, and this is one where we're actually not providing diagnostic information, but it's really a tool to help the physician uh, advise his patient by telling him in which risk category a patient uh, situates herself. Is it a low risk patient, an average risk or a high risk patient compared to the average population? Uh, the data, uh, a large quantity of data, as you can imagine uh, for Quebec will be stored in the University Laval Pulsar database. That's a new database in Laval. So we've also helped 
uh, when I mentioned that we like to look at policies and that we can help you to tell you if your policies are interoperable, that's a perfect example of this. We had to look at what were the need of Jacques Simard for the perspective project uh, in terms of uh, his consent policies uh, and, and his protocol. Did that allow him to store data in the Pulsar database and what kind of condition had to be negotiated specifically for his project? Uh, we developed all the government's tool to care of all the ethic approval process for the project. Uh, we also do some research component to the project, for example, uh, on genetic discrimination and the protection against uh, that problem, data privacy, professional liability, uh, for example, for new professionals that are going to be involved in disclosing uh, some of these results or working with the physician uh, and the risk prediction model, uh, using the model via telemedicine, et cetera. Uh, and ongoing assistance on all arising ethical issues. We also work on, on large, large scale international project. That's the example of one. Uh, I won't spend too much time on it because I think I've already given a couple of really good examples. but just to say, uh, this is a project that originally was in over 20 country. Now I think as it is in stage two, it's a little bit smaller in, in scale as we're getting closer to the clinic. So uh, the Argo project in the, is the new phase of the International Cancer Genome Consortium was launched in 2019. The idea is to analyze uh, in the same manner specimen for over, from over 100,000 cancer patients with high quality clinical data. So it is a project that really is at the clinical level and that's what's really different uh, it's, it's actually quite rare for a project of this scope to go to that level uh, in data, to have that kind of sophisticated data. Uh, and, and of course, uh, what you see on the right uh, is uh, how the access to data function for the data of the International Cancer Consortium. We're running the access office for them. Uh, and, and this, uh, we, we give you a bit of the numbers. Uh, to show you that it is quite busy. Uh, we also chair the ethics and governance committee of the consortium for a long time until 2020. Uh, consultation on data governance, ethic conformity, other aspect of the project and help them develop their policies. And also uh, I developed the framework for them on how they should engage with industry because of course they were not doing that when they were only a research organization but as I mentioned, the second stage is closer to clinical care. They wanna work with clinical trials and industry is interested. So how could they engage with industry in an ethical manner that would re, uh, preserve the trust of the participant is what we were looking at. So uh, in closing, because uh, I do want us to have plenty of time for discussion, uh, probably some of you, and, and this is something I hear uh, probably too much uh, since I've been uh, in, in, in my field and, and with the particular model that we have is, but you're doing ethics. Why are you charging us for that? Uh, it's, it's, shouldn't it be free? Uh, well, so first of all, there's a growing need for this kind of service at top research university. And what I mean by that is that I get phone calls all the time from colleagues that have questions on this and that aspect of their project. And I'm happy to help them and I'll, I'll do it for free if they only wanna ask me a quick question. But the reality of it is most of the time it gets really, you know, one question raises another and then it starts to be, okay, I'll need to analyze this policy and you wanna do a good work. Uh, so that's the first reason. Uh, the second reason is uh, there is service actually at McGill that can help you do some of the things that we propose for free. And some of them are quite good. But the reality is that if you want to stay on top of the field, you really need to do research at the same time as you develop service and provide tool. It's the only way to keep track with the high pace and the high development of this type of research. 
And we're in many of those key organizations doing the research and doing research with them. And that's why we understand it so well. And we're really uh, at the edge in terms of, of developing tools. Uh, but again, uh, this uh, means that we're quite qualified and that uh, there's a lot of energy and effort put into this. Uh, research funding is, is sadly in a really bad state for ethical, legal, and social research aspect of health research, you wouldn't think so. You'd think it would be important, uh, but it's sadly not to our funders. It's extremely difficult to get a substantial amount of money in this field. So that's a source of revenue that we can't really too much depend on. So maintaining a large team like we do, uh, is it would be really challenging if we couldn't have also uh, the option of sometime uh, providing services uh, for cost compensation. Uh, what I can say is all projects that have sought our assistance in the past are repeat customers. And I've learned the value of the added ethical component to the project. They're coming back for new ideas of collaboration all the time, and we're really happy uh, to help them do this. Uh, and, and, you know, I, you probably would like to have an idea of how much things cost. Uh, and I'm not going to do that. I, I really one thing we want to do is really discuss with people and understand their project before we talk about these things. Uh, and, and what I can tell you usually is that if uh, there's under $15,000 involved, we will lose money. Our group will lose money in providing services. So we likely won't be too interested in providing it. As I mentioned, there are a lot of other options at McGill that can probably help you if you have a very specific point. We might be able to just tell you the direction in which you should be going and to recommend some place to go. Uh, but, but yes, under $15,000, it's, it's really uh, usually not the kind of project that we would be looking into too much. Uh, let's, uh, in closing, uh, you have uh, the address of our executive director uh, in case you're ever interested in some of the service that I've mentioned, uh, you're more than welcome to contact us. And, and we just like to talk and hear about new projects. So uh, don't hesitate to contact us with any questions you may have. Uh, thank you. And I, I think we can open it to question. I'll be happy to address any you might have. Thanks, Professor Jolie. That was uh, very informative. Um, I'll leave the, I'll keep an eye on the chat, but maybe I'll start with a question. Uh, so the services you provide, they, they certainly sound um, useful. Uh, is it specific, like, are you looking for research projects or I guess outreach from PIs who are doing research projects that are specific to either AI or genomics, or is it actually broader than that is my first question. I would say most of the project that, that we are right now collaborating with fall into either of these fields or both. But at the same time, uh, for example, uh, we have had project in the field of neuromedicine in the past where, where we've been involved and that was interesting. So it's all, also, it depends on the project. It will we'll be very frank and if we think we can help, and we know the, the issues that, that you might have to deal with, uh, we'll be happy to, to, to provide services. Uh, I think that's, that's why I'm saying the best way to do this is call us and, and present the project. Mm -hmm. And my second question, uh, like as some of us are frantically preparing grants for this uh, cycle, which is like uh, less than a month away, um, I'm sort of having a feeling of, oh, I, I wish I had thought of doing this much, much earlier, because I'm sure you don't want last minute requests and to really deliver high quality services, you want a, a, you know, a good lead time. So what is your um, mm -hmm. desire sort of, like when would you want, let's say a research a PI has a research project that they, it's just very, in the, it's in the early stages, they're just sort of thinking about it. At what stage, Right. Should they reach out to you with respect to, say, a grant deadline? And, and is, is the notion that, like, the initial interactions are sort of 
pro bono, but then it gets incorporated into a budget? Is that like so, those sorts of questions? So, so I would say, when should you contact us? The sooner, the better, of course. Uh, but now, yes, I do understand that. And, and you're absolutely right. There's so many cases where scientists come to see us at the last minute because they didn't think that they would need an ethics component. They didn't even plan it in their budget. And all of a sudden, they're learning that, you know, it's, it can't go forward without one. Uh, so, I mean, if this is the case, again, we're always open to talking about exactly what it is that you need. And, and, you know, yes, there are some time possibility of saying, okay, we'll help you, you know, developing this consent form, but we'll also budget for a research component on this question or that question, and we'll use some of that budget to pay us back. I mean, these are things that we, we might be open to do. It depends on how much work, of course, would be, would be re required. Okay, thanks. I, I could definitely see how having a real polished kind of plan, research plan that in, in incorporates ethics and data security and close, all the things that you mentioned, it would probably look good to a CHR reviewer that, you know, you're, this is like a, a, a complete project. As, as I mentioned, I think that nowadays it's becoming, especially as soon as you have a grant that's fairly large scale, it, it's going to come up. It's mm -hmm. going to come up in one form or another. It could be uh, equity, inclusion, diversity questions that are going to be asked. Uh, it could be your privacy and confidentiality or your data sharing policy. You might be asked, are you going to be conformed to the CIHR policy? Uh, so yeah, Okay. For all example. There's a question from um, someone using the Intmed login. <laughs> I know it That's Kaveri, well. how are you? <laughs> Thank you so much, Jan, for joining us. I apologize for being in scrubs, but at least I'm not wearing the mask. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that was a fantastic presentation as usual. And, and I feel like, you know, we're now all evolving into a much more sophisticated era and really taking advantage of the intellectual capital we have across McGill. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of the things that we would do at the last minute, or we would kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, pull together whatever we can, we can't afford to anymore. So that comes to for instance, um, uh, you know, having uh, everything from having a proper analytic plan, and now we have a, a data analysis platform at our Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, uh, data management, uh, uh, we're developing a platform with Isabel Fortier to have really sophisticated data management. And this, Yen, you open a whole really new and important area that we have to think about seriously. So I, I, I really love that you're doing this work. And I guess my question is, how, how would you envision um, or how do you interact with, for instance, at, uh, at the RI, we have a, a contracts department and there are a couple of lawyers that help us with agreements, but I don't think they have the time or bandwidth to do you know, the kind of research that you're doing in particular areas, but could you comment on how you would interact with them and what that might look like? Absolutely. I mean, usually the service are just naturally complementary, uh, meaning that, that, you know, we start where they end. They'll probably come up and say, you, okay, uh, do you want a material transfer agreement? Here's what we propose. Do you want an IP policy uh, for your, for your uh, samples or for your data or uh, for your software, et cetera? And then they'll give you one. Then we're going to look at it for you and we're gonna say, listen, if I were you, I would go with this section, I would cross off that, this is what we would do, uh, is, is we'll build after uh, what they've developed and, and very often you show it back to them and they're like, okay, that's a great idea, that's not a problem, why don't we move forward like this? Uh, some of them already know us because they've worked with us on a project or another and they also see the benefit in, in, in this sort of approach. Fantastic. So that might kind of work its way into kind of the estimated time on your part, if you know Absolutely. you're working with, uh, okay, perfect. And, and, and we know which document they, 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 they will do. They tend to do documents that are more contractual, okay. while we do more like policies and ethical uh, guidelines, etc. Okay. 
well, I know at the RI level, we need many more policies. So I may be coming to you with my director's hat eventually. <laughs> but I think Teresa has a question. So I'll let her. And that's a great question because I wanted to talk to that. Uh, so the receptivity for budgeting it as part of a project uh, can be quite good. We have to generally, we, we have to turn it into a research question. Because of course, if it's a research application, it needs to be turned into a research question. But we can usually do this uh, because a lot of what we're developing is novel. So we will present it as a novel framework for this or that. And, and, and usually that, can, that, that will fly. Uh, the problem is, as I was mentioned, if we were to submit an independent application, and, and it's, the, it's a sad situation in a way, uh, is that it's really difficult to obtain a lot of funding for our kind of work. It's not yet very much recognized uh, by CIHR or other. They do fund some application, but not, not enough to uh, let us because you know the, the, the other side of the coin is if they're not funding us, then it falls on the researcher's shoulders to find a way to finance us to help them, uh, which I don't think is, is necessarily the right model. Personally, I would prefer another model. Um, just to follow on up on that, for example, large scale randomized controlled trials that are multi-institutional. Mm -hmm. Um, I would think that uh, the type of service that you're talking about, would that include data and safety monitoring committee? Probably not, uh, because that really is substantive, uh, substantively determined. But uh, I can see where the it's, service yep. that you're talking about could really come in handy for a longer, multi-jurisdictional, multi-center randomized control trial, for example. Yes, what, what we would need to propose then would be that it's not the same standard job that the data safety monitoring committee usually does that we are indeed proposing a novel framework to do that and helping coordinate that then we would have a good argument uh, to propose it as part of a cihr let's say yeah yeah because um I got the sense that that most of the work that you do are, are huge projects, province wide or Canada wide, um, with a budget of over 15,000, for example, individual investigators, although our in individual investigator projects are now getting larger because we have more partners, et cetera, et cetera. But some of us still have, you know, in the reasonable, like under, let's say under $500,000 kind of budget, you know um for let's say three years or something like that um so yeah. I, i'm thinking that that kind of a situation isn't really what you're what you're keen about doing or supporting well it's 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 not it, it, again it's a question of of managing to recover my costs it's not it's not a personal i i i sometimes will enjoy much more a smaller project and I wouldn't enjoy necessarily a big one but and and yeah it's it's the nature of thing that that 15,000 because we're all basically human resources us it's human yeah. resource intensive so it means we have to put person with a specific skill set to help develop and and very often when you ask to develop one document you're really asking us nevertheless to understand the whole project so that the document fits in just right. Because again, if you're just looking for a template, you can probably find it somewhere else at McGill for free. So that's where the, the yes, the issue is. And that's where I'd love to be able to find ways to have uh, the funding come from CIHR or from other organization. And sometimes, to be fair, sometimes they do provide it. But it's just that if you compare how much money is provided for ethical, legal, social issues compared to bioinformatics, for example, or, or science, it's, it's a very different proportion, as you can imagine. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed your talk. And um, I think it's so important for us to know that where you are and, and what you can do. Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Thanks, Teresa. There's a question from Amanda. Hi, Dr. Jolie, thank you so much for your oh. talk. Uh, so uh, um, our team is starting a new biobank. And I wanted to know in the early stages of a project, 
how important is it to really envision kind of the future of the project, like uh, the data sharing? Uh, is it possible that our like consent forms that we derive might be too restrictive and that this will cause problems in the future? Like, must we really think about the, uh, where, how this data can be used far down the line? And if we don't do that, will this cause problems? So the, the, the answer is you need to see far, but mm -hmm. it's the level of granularity that's going to be a little bit different at your stage than at a later stage. So for example, you do need to think about who you'll be sharing already at this point. In broad term, are you going to share with industry or not, for example? But at the same time, you don't need to think to the level of granularity where you'll have to start saying who's going to be on your data access committee. You know, that's that's too much detail, probably at this stage. I mean, depending on where you're applying, I mean, some uh, but but generally that's that's I, I would say what the difference is, is that uh, the farther you are from the realization of the project and depending on how much pages they have, you're, you're afforded in the application form, then you probably will go in fairly broad terms rather than be very granular and, and detail. Okay, but if we're not thinking far enough, we might have problems down the line. Um... Oh, absolutely. I mean, for example, let's say that you're uh, disclosing to your participant that their data will only be used uh, for uh, research on uh, specific types of pediatric cancer, for example, and that you know the data uh, will uh, remain at all times stored at the MUHC, for example. Well, you're sort of stuck with those terms. So, so once you've done that, I mean, we might be able to reinterpret it, to broaden it a little bit, but the reality of it is if that's what you've told your participant and they've signed for that, then after you can change and say, well, you know what? Merck's is really interested with what we're doing. We wanna share some data with them uh, and, and, and they have a nice agreement that they want us to sign. Uh, you have to reconsent everybody that you've consented. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. It's a good example of the importance of planning in advance. Uh, okay, so I think that's all the questions that I can identify. So, oh, maybe Jill. Hi there. Oh, and Therese as well. Um, hi, Dr. Julie. I am the Jill in your inbox as well. Uh, I just had a kind of. You're the what? Sorry, Jill. I. I Oh, I'm the Jill that's also in your email inbox. Yes, I thought I, thought I saw that name before. Yes, um, I just had a kind of broad question. Um, and I'm wondering, as someone that works in research grants, do you find that the ethical policies or requirements put in place by funding agencies are able to keep up with evolving technology and research? Or do policies that are slow to change end up restricting research or worse loopholes that maybe allow less ethical research to uh, take place? Uh, I, I would say it's not necessarily the funding agencies that, that, that have policies that would slow down research. I'm, I'm more worried about, for example, provincial uh, privacy policies, uh, I mean, which are really uh, a little bit uh, late, uh, I mean, compared to the rest of Canada, they're not as permissive for researchers in, in Quebec compared to many other provinces. Uh, and, and also there's no one-stop access to the data yet or not, not as easy as we'd like it to be. So that's one area, for example, uh, where things could change. Uh, Sometimes research ethics committee can also uh, be a little bit slow uh, to change, uh, for example, on what types of consent uh, they're authorizing. They might not be as permissive as some researchers would like them to be. Uh, and, and again, that's something that, that we can usually work on. We usually have very good relationship. And, and to be fair, the McGill Ethics Committee are actually quite good uh, if you compare to that of many other hospitals. So. Uh, it's, it's generally very feasible to talk to them and to sort of explain if it's a new type of project they're not familiar with. Uh, so that's, that's usually handled well. Okay, and out of curiosity, is there like a specific policy in Quebec 
that you feel like is inhibiting research right now? And um, through the Center for Genomic Policy, uh, are you involved in kind of uh, lobbying or contacting the provincial government on oh, yes. changes? Yeah. So, so for example, uh, we were uh, very much involved in the debates on the law uh, to prevent genetic discrimination. Uh, that's a law that's been recently adopted by the Canadian Parliament. And, and actually, uh, we didn't like the way the law was formulated. We thought that, you know, it's, it's great that you want to prevent discrimination, but, but the result of applying this law is that it's going to prevent some type of discrimination, but not some other. And, and there were a lot of cracks in the laws. So this is something, and, and we're going to have a paper actually released on, on that particular law soon. Uh, that's been accepted for publication, but that's one example. And, and we've made representation to the Senate at the time when the law was adopted. So yes, these are the kind of things we would do as well. Okay, that was all for me. Thank you so much. And um, I'll chat with you next week. My pleasure, Jill. Talk to you soon. Okay. Hi, Teresa, you had one more question? Yes, I didn't want to let you go. I didn't want to Ben to close the <laughs> session. Um, because I, I had something similar in mind. I wanted, wanted to know if you were governed by the Tri-Council Ethics um, Policy Statement. And also, uh, you are developing, um, you know, different types of policies and different types of um, mm -hmm. guidance, if you will, uh, here in Quebec at McGill University. And so I was wondering, it is the University of Toronto, do they have a similar type of group? Are you, are you working together, are you partnering with other um, institutions in Canada so that we can have a uniform or a, a harmonization at least across this country? Um, right. Because that, as we, as investigators get more into partnered uh, research across the country and even internationally, but let's just keep it in Canada right now. Um, it's difficult. It would be so nice to hear that there was a Canadian kind of collaboration doing the research that you're doing so that Toronto's included or BC. It's not just McGill kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, what I could say is, is we're definitely talking with, with researchers in other provinces. Uh, as I mentioned, I really do think in Canada, there's no other center of our size on, on this particular for DC that offers the service and do the research we're doing. But there are other excellent investigators, though, and, and we do talk with them. The problem, however, is that, uh, you know, we can advocate for changes in law and ethics policies, but uh, very, you know, we don't write the law. Uh, the government's going to write it. Yeah. And, and of course, if they're smart, they'll, they'll document themselves well before writing it, they'll listen to advice. But at the last instance, you know, they're the one that, that make the choice. And the problem, for example, and I'm, I'm going back to the idea of privacy because it's a really good illustration. Uh, in, in Canada, uh, privacy, there are some laws at the federal level, but as far as health privacy is concerned, it's mostly at the provincial level that it gets decided. So you end up with province each having their own law, which are fairly equivalent, but not completely. And then that's where, you know, it gets really like a little maze where you have to check at each of them every time to see if they're interoperable. And, and it's also making it easy for people to use it as an excuse to say, no, we can't share our data, for example. Okay, well, that's really helpful because I think it's good for us that are doing this type of partnered research to know that you have all of this information. <laughs> we don't have all of it, but we can find it. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure, Teresa. All right, that was a very fruitful discussion. Um, I'll thank everyone for, for attending and thank Professor Jardy. You'll probably be hearing from some of us in the, in the future. Thank you for me giving me the opportunity to present. That's what, that was uh, very pleasant, and I look forward to talking more uh, to all of you. <laughs>